How, how many people believe that uh, every human is unique? We're all unique. Yeah? Humans are unique. Amazing. I agree. But our behaviors are not. The way we make decisions, the way we act, the way we interpret the world around us, those are not unique. And those can actually be classified and documented. And so what I want to show you is a little bit of that documentation that we know about human behavior and how we make decisions. And uh, my goal here is for you to be able to understand a little bit of that dark art side, that, uh, that whole dark world that we know exists, but we're not really told about, and we only hear in whispers of rooms. And so I want to show you some of those, and we can nerd out together. And speaking of compliance, <coughs> claim disclaimer. Uh, everything I'm going to show you today is uh, all for entertainment and uh, educational purposes. And anything I show you today, there is no guarantees on results that you get from them. I am only going to show you how billion-dollar corporations apply these principles that I'm showing you today. But there's no guarantees. All right, <clears throat> moving on. Dark art advertising, like I said, is, is really the idea of, of taking what we believe to be real in the world, what we, how most people see the world today, and showing you the actual color that's with inside it. If I can show you the, the little methods, the little levers that are being pulled, um, it's kind of like you know if you've ever left a lesson, left a training, and then you start seeing it in the world around you, right? You ever buy a, a certain car or a certain color of car, right? All of a sudden, it's like everyone all of a sudden has this car and this color, right? But we've never seen it before. And, and dark art advertising is very much the same way. When you leave this room today, you're going to be able to leave and start actually seeing these little levers being pulled around you, whether it's a Super Bowl commercial or an advertisement that you see on social media. And a lot of you are actually doing some of these concepts, but you've never actually understood what you were really doing. And so I want to be able to show you what those things are, how to do them, and so that you can start leveraging them in your advertising going forward. And the big thing here uh, is that it is not my responsibility to make sure you're being ethical. Okay. My only goal here is to show you tools that you can use, and you are responsible for using them correctly. But my intention is that if you stay in this room, you stay into this training, you stay through everything that you're learning here today, is that you're using these principles ethically. Not even just what I'm showing you, but what Taylor shows you, what everyone else shows you, is that you are choosing to use these things ethically. Because how many of you know, um, especially in our space, people can fuck up a lot of lives. Cool. So we're going to begin this training with that context, that foundation that you're going to use this ethically. Cool. So dark art advertising is really just understanding the true advanced marketing methods that are being used. Um, only really about the top 1% actually know what they're doing and apply these principles consistently. Um, a lot of people will apply these principles holistically or they hint at it, but maybe not even know that they're doing them. And so really uh, what dark art advertising is, is that it uses psychology and persuasion to get advertisers to do correct campaigns, campaigns at scale that win. Uh, and it trains people, the market, really how to think. Right? This is actually a principle that Taylor talks about all the time, is that you're not teaching people what to do. You teach people what to do, but only after you've taught them how to think. Because if you cannot tell a market how to think, then they don't perceive your next messaging correctly. Right? And so what this does is it tells the market how to think, based on what we already know about how they view the world itself, right? Cool. So each art, I'm going to give you five arts today. Uh, each art is going to be, I'm going to show, tell you the principle and the concept of it, uh, the definitions of it, why and how it works. I'm going to show you a real-world example. Most of these are billion-dollar companies that have effectively applied this principle in advertising, and I will show you those campaigns. I will show you the results that came from it, and then I will show you how you can apply it in your marketing. All right. So before we begin, the, the most important aspect is understanding that people make decisions based on motivations, right? Taylor talked a little bit about this. He said that there are really kind of two motivations that people have. Technically speaking, there's nine. And the psychological motivators that people have is often why they make a decision in the first place. Most marketers will focus on the pain and the desire that their market has, right? You've heard this all the time. Figure out how to take your prospect from hell to heaven, and that's how you win. The problem is most marketers forget that there is a motivation behind why that is a hell and why that is a heaven for them. But there's also still a motivation behind taking action on it. Because we all have pains in our lives. We all have things that we want. But very few of us actually take action behind that, getting away from that pain or going towards desire. 
And so if you want to be an effective marketer, you have to understand what is the motivator that is great enough to actually get them to take action, right? Example I always love, how many of you have ever been on the couch, you've been hungry, but the fridge just feels so dang far away. So you just lay there, you know what I mean? You just don't get up, right? You had a pain, you had a desire, but the motivator itself was not great enough for you to actually take action, right? And so what you want to do, oh, actually, how many of you would like these lights? Like, does this feel small to you? Yeah. Amazing, guys. You know, I'm a great marketer, right? So if you have your phones, go to Instagram, or if you have your computer, go to Instagram or Facebook, either one. If you don't have either, just discover the Internet. But go to Instagram or Facebook. Uh, and go, if you're on Instagram, go to at Ashton.Shanks. You should see me pull up. Then there's a nice, lovely link in bio. Click that guy. And then there at the top, there should be a button that says London Event Slides. Thought ahead for you. Came in. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. And check this out. Check this out. Even better, even better. <clears throat> As you're pulling that up, go ahead and hit that follow button. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> hit that follow button. And you may or may not get retargeted with ads. Cool. So if you need the slides, I know this is small. Feel free to pull that up. You can follow along there, and you can keep those slides for yourself, study later, or just use for this presentation. Cool. As you guys are doing that, I'm just going to briefly talk about these different motivators that people have. So really, there are nine psychological motivators that people have uh, when it comes to taking action, right? And these all do relate back to, like Taylor said, really, at the end of the day, is to survive and to not be alone, right? But there are different nuances to how we feel those motivations, right? How we perceive or how we communicate those motivations, and they fall into one of these nine categories. Either first, achievement, right? We want to feel like we're triumphant, victorious, or autonomy, right? We want to have the feeling of being unique, being able to have control over our decisions. The next one is belonging, right? We want to feel being aligned. We want to be in the tribe. Next is competence. The next is empowerment, right? We want to feel authorized to do what we want in life. Then there's engagement. Then there's esteem, nurturance, and security. All of these are different motivators that we have psychologically to take action, right? And so the goal in advertising is to not just understand what their pain is, what their desire is, but to understand what is the greatest motivation that they could possibly have for taking that desire or running away from that pain. And so your ads will always want to first understand what is that thing and then align your advertising, your messaging around that motivation because that right there is what's going to get them to click, right? The goal in advertising and what we're talking about specifically, direct response advertising, is to get them to take action. So if all you do is focus on desire or running away from a pain, you're not actually encouraging action. You're encouraging identification, which is different. And so what you want to make sure that you're doing is you're aligning around the motivator to actually take that action. And I'll show you some examples here. But this is the baseline context for what we want to create advertising around and ensure that no matter what campaign we create, it's aligning or attaching itself to some type of motivator that we know our market has. Cool. Let's talk about the psychology of persuasion first. Eugene Schwartz says that there are three things that are required for persuasion. Okay? or that your ads must do if you want to have any level of scale inside of a campaign that isn't just a fast action discount. Right? So what you want to really do is understand the three legs. The three-legged stool, simple metaphor. If you're missing one of the legs, what happens? Great, awesome, responsive. Are we feeling good? Did you guys get alcohol? No. Yeah, you guys are high performers. I get it. You guys probably have, like, celery juice and, like, stem cells on your tables or something like that, right? All right, cool. Let's talk about the first leg, which is desire. Desire, right? Very simple, very straightforward. Um, your offer must entice and capitalize on your market's wants, yearns for, and is motivated by, right? In your mind, what you want to pretend is that your market is sick and you are the doctor, right? And so the goal is, is that you're providing the cure. Now, the interesting one, and I had a conversation last night very similar to this, is that what we understand as experts is that the cure for a lot of people's problems is not what they first perceive it to be, right? So ops people, 
when we talk about it, what does everyone want? And this is the conversation last night. It's like no one wants to understand that they have to build a good culture or they have to build better habits. What they want is a spreadsheet that fixes things for them, right? And so as a doctor or as a business owner, I first must present to the market a similar cure to what they think their cure is supposed to be, right? I have to earn their ability and the, the permission to actually educate them on what they really need. But if you're a business owner creating marketing, you have to understand that you, if you have this incredible cure, unless your market actually thinks that that cure aligns with what they perceive it could be, then they, they'll ignore it because they're looking for what they think they need, right? But the first thing is understanding what they desire. You must understand what the market desires not what you desire for them to have, okay? There's a difference. And so what I often say is like, if you think of the example of what marketing really is at the end of the day, marketing is us on one side and my market over here, and they're all just standing in a crowd, right? They have a need, right? And I'm a marketer and there's all these other marketers around me and all the other businesses, all your competitors. And the, all it really is, all marketing really is, is us sending messages over to them going, is this how you feel? And their response is your place in the market. That's it. It is the marketer of the business that can best communicate how they feel and them going, that's exactly how I feel. That's the business that wins, right? So that's all that marketing is. And so our first goal is to understand what is their truest desire, not just what they say or communicate what they actually think, what they stay up late at night talking about. What is even the things that they know, they're not communicating to anyone else, but that's exactly how they feel. So it is the marketer that can best describe that first. That's the first stage to persuasion, not just marketing, but persuasion in general. The second is identification. Identification. So um, your prospect, or, or really what you're doing, is you're not just demonstrating to your prospects um, what they just bought. People don't just buy things because of its utility only, right? No one buys a Ferrari because it gets them to point A to point B, and it has a great safety rating, right? No one buys a Ferrari for that purpose, right? No one's buying Louis Vuitton sand, uh, heels because they're super comfortable, okay? <laughs> we buy things not just because of what they do, but because of what it says about us, right? And so in your marketing, you can't just attach to desire, you also have to start learning about what does it say about them and enforcing that identity when they're making a decision, okay? Why should you buy today? Or even Taylor actually was doing it earlier. It was a pre-frame of like action takers, right? Having a conversation of like, okay, well, what are you going to do to stay out of that 85% that fails? Why, why are you that thing? He's having the prospect create their own identity so that he can enforce their identity through an action, which is conversion. Right? And so you can't just understand desire, but you also must understand what is the identity that that person is creating or wanting to create, and your product or service is a path for them to create or enforce the identity they believe they have. Right? Example, why, it's the same reason why people shop at Whole Foods versus Walmart. You can get food at both, but there is an identity that you are trying to enforce by shopping at one of those locations. Right? Even if it's not immediately at the surface, there is an identity of why you're going to that place willing to pay more in order to get sustenance, calories. That's what we're talking about. That's it. Right? We're trying to buy calories, but there is a reason why we're willing to pay more for a different type of calorie. Gucci versus Nike, same thing. It's branding. And this is why massive corporations spend millions, if not billions of dollars on branding, not direct response. Direct response means take action. I put a dollar in, I want two, three, four, five dollars out. Branding requires none of that. Branding companies focus on impressions. Specifically, impressions per capita, right? If I'm targeting London, I, a, a big branding company will go, okay, great, we want, uh, we want 100 impressions per capita, which means they're going to spend X amount of money just to get their brand in front of so many people 100 times over the next 60 or 90 days, right? That is what branding does. And it's not because they're trying to get you to make a decision. They're trying to get you to align your identity with their brand. They're trying to create people who start to develop their own identities in what they're selling. That's why it's like there's a distinct difference between the demographics that buy Pepsi versus Coca-Cola. They have figured out 
the identity they want to attract, and they're spending billions of dollars to enforce that identity on other people. This is dark art advertising. Cool? So that's the second leg that you must have. Not just this is what we do, but this is why you would go with us. This is what it says about you as a person if you go with us. Okay? Final one is belief. Belief. No one wants to believe that a decision they make will bounce back into their face. Right? Same thing while he was talking about uh, I need to talk to my wife. Right? The reason is it's not because they're, maybe their wife doesn't trust them, but ultimately at the end of the day they don't trust themselves. And they don't trust themselves to make a decision and it possibly come bad against them, maybe because that's past experience, right? And so it's the belief and the identity that's affecting that decision, but belief is something you must enforce. A lot of times, what we'll do is we'll go against the identity. We'll be like, well, you know, what, what kind of person are you? How do you make decisions? You know, people don't need time to think. They need information to think. We're trying to enforce different identities inside of someone, but we forget about the whole idea of belief after the fact. How will it feel when you wake up tomorrow morning knowing you made the right decision? Knowing that all of a sudden all of these dark paths and cloudy waters that you had are all of a sudden now clear and the sun is out. And you might not be to the destination you want to go, but you at least now have a clear as day path to get there. You know where you're going, right? You now have a map. The weakest form of this is guarantees. But this is what we see in the marketplace everywhere. We'll do X result or your money back. This will happen or you don't pay. We are trying to manufacture belief in someone's eyes by just trying to take risk off the table as if that builds actual belief. I would argue it actually creates more disbelief. And so if you have a guarantee offer and you're wondering why you have the shittiest clients, because you're finding people that don't actually create belief for themselves, they hedge risk. Different type of person, right? And so you want to figure out, is my marketing not just attaching itself to desire, creating the correct identity or enforcing the correct identity I want from my prospects, but are they actually creating belief or are we demonstrating the reason to have belief in our marketing? This is why demonstration advertising is some of the most powerful advertising in the entire world. Because if you cannot get them to create belief, you can demonstrate it in front of them, right? So it is how can I create this demonstration or how can I manufacture belief inside of my marketing? And your marketing does not just end at the conversion. It ends when they wake up the next day. It also is the next month, the next year. Why Taylor's talking about long term is because you actually, the more you can create that long term picture of what their lives look like after they convert, the more you generate belief inside of them. Because now they're not here where their problems lie. They're way over here where all of that is solved, right? That's why the cl most classic upsell strategy in funnels, complete side note, that's why the most classic upsell strategy in funnels is you're selling them what they want, you give them what they need, and now you've created a new problem or they've created a new problem that you can now sell them a solution for, right? Selling them on Facebook ads, how to get leads, right? My first upsell might be how do you scale those Facebook ads because now you figured out how to get leads. Now how do you get more of them for the same cost? The next problem, right? Well, now you've got all these leads, but you probably have no way to nurture them. And if you don't nurture them, you're going to have all this money sinking through your ship. So what am I going to sell you? A nurturing lead system. That's my next upsell, right? So I'm just creating the path of, hey, we're not even focused here because this is already solved. I've now created so much belief that you're living in this future state that I can actually now sell you products that solve a problem you don't have yet. If you take conversion rates, the people who have converted, this is why people are like, hey, the people who bought your upsells are your highest value customers. That's because you've created so much belief in them at that moment, they're not even thinking about their current problems. They're trying to solve problems they don't even have yet because they believe you're marketing. So if you have a lot of upsells, you're in a good spot. You're communi communicating something correctly. Art number one, you guys ready? You guys don't feel ready. Say art number one. Art number one. There we go. Conspicuous consumption. Whew, big words. All right, get ready. Conspicuous consumption. That's the first art. This art really taps into belonging. Um, but essentially what it is, it's a term that is used to describe spending money on displaying luxury goods and services to extend one's own prestige. Right? So the first art that 
big corporations and marketing companies and branding companies around the world understand about humans is that we, uh, there, for most people, we have conspicuous consumption in our minds, in our psychology. We buy things not just because of what they do, but because of what it says about us and what rank we feel it puts us in society, right? So, case study time. Let's talk about diamonds. Diamonds. How many of you are wearing a diamond ring right now? Cool. Diamond wedding ring or engagement ring. Cool, cool, cool. A few of you. So, until the late 19th century, diamonds really were only found a few river beds in India and the jungles of Brazil, right? Uh, very rare. People, honestly, they didn't actually use diamond rings for wedding rings or engagement rings. It wasn't a thing because diamonds were very, very rare and they were hard to find, okay? So we never really thought of like, hey, you know, even the idea of having a diamond in a ring, it wasn't something people sought after. Okay? It just wasn't something that people thought about. It, in 1870, huge diamond mines were discovered near the Orange River, and miners really kind of needed a way to control the supply, right? This is simple economics. The more supply you have, the less value it is, therefore the less value that product actually has to the marketplace. Um, so essentially what happened was all of the miners around the world came together and formed uh, the largest cartel to history uh, that's ever known called De Beers Diamonds. You probably have heard of that brand. It's a retail store. But they formed this cartel called De Beers Diamonds because they understood that, man, we just have a massive amount of diamonds, and so we must form one company that can control the supply uh, so that we don't all just lose our jobs, Right? So they formed this cartel that they can have control over diamonds and therefore hopefully try to survive and live uh, because the next problem that they would have was not just, hey, if we control the supply, that's a good thing for us, but we can't have people buy diamonds and then sell them. That's a problem because if we just do that, then eventually our market will get diluted because people will buy the diamonds, sell them, and then now there's more diamonds in the marketplace and then we suck. So how can we create a product that people will buy our diamonds at the control that we have on supply, but then not sell them so they don't kill our market share and they don't dilute the marketplace, right? Love and engagement rings. They hired an agency out of Philadelphia called NWA Ayers & Son, uh, in 19, uh, founded in 1969, and they proposed the concept of conspicuous consumption in the marketplace. So they essentially said that the, di the substantial diamond gift can be made uh, more widely sought after a symbol of personal family, or personal or family success. Uh, and it's an expression of so socioeconomic achievement. Uh, so they said, they stated in the report, to promote the diamond as it one material object which can reflect in a very real way a man's success in life. Let's make it an engagement ring so that the men will buy bigger diamonds, more expensive diamonds, because in a weird way we can tie back the size of someone's diamonds to the man's success in life. Women, is this true? Let's face it, well, you know, let's go, yeah, yeah, let's be real, you know, yeah, love, sure. Let's face it, it's a comparison. Whether we voice it or not voice it, it's a comparison. At least even to men, if you don't believe women do it, men do it. Cool. So, what they essentially did uh, was they spread out the word of the diamonds to everywhere that they can. What they went after was the movie stars, the politicians, the politicians' wives, uh, actors, they spent, put these diamond rings on every of the political influencers. This is the original influencer marketing, but they put it on these influencers around uh, so that people and young girls would start seeing them. Here was the brilliance and the dark art advertising side of this campaign. They did not go after women who were 20. They did not go after women who were 30 because those type of people were already indoctrinated that diamonds is not something that you put on a wedding ring or an engagement ring. So they didn't go after those people. They went after the girls in junior high. They started hosting assemblies in junior highs, in high schools, educating these girls on the beauty of diamonds, on the pop stars and the singers and all of these things. They made sure that these people had it on their rings at all times. And they went after those people because they knew that we would not be able to sell it to the current market. We need to sell it to the market that will be getting married in five years, 10 years, 15 years, 20 years. If we can get it a norm for them psychologically, that's how we win, right? Is this cool stuff? Have you guys heard this stuff before? Okay, that's pretty cool. So, in 1939, De Beers, U.S. Diamonds sales amounted to 23 million. By 1979, 2.1 billion. All from this campaign, women, have you ever heard a diamond is forever? That's their campaign. 
That was the advertising angle they came up with to influence an entire generation, now an entire species, of the importance of having diamonds and rings so that they could live. All right. Let's talk about marketing strategies for this. One, when you can highlight social impact inside of your advertising, what do you do beyond the conversions? This is, in a weird way, how we can build conspicuous consumption inside of a market because it raises the status they believe they have when they buy something, even if it's more expensive, right? So how can we highlight the social impact? Uh, this talks about, you know, uh, how is it helping influencers? How is it helping people that we look up to? Next, creating a VIP experience. If you guys have ever shopped at any designer store, right, Gucci, Louis Vuitton, anything, right, you probably got a text at some point from someone that sold you something there. That's offering you a chance to come in and see a private showing of their next collection before it's out or before other people get to do it, right? I'm trying to elevate the ego inside of you and give you the feeling that you are a status. You're not just like everyone else. You're special. So how can you start creating VIP experiences for people uh, that work with you or your company? Using aspirational imagery. So this is very simple. This is why um, one of you know, Marlboro's best campaigns was a, a cowboy smoking. It was just like they're bringing out that brawn-like feeling that people wanted to aspire to. So the more aspirational imagery uh, or language that you can create around your advertising to a market that is correct with what they aspire to be, then you will get increased conversions. Next, showcasing celebrity endorsements. This is why influencers, even micro-influencers across the board right now are doing really, really well. Right? It's because we attach more trust to people than brands. But also, if we can attach the people we aspire to be like, uh, this is why a supplement company would use like a sports player or a wrestler, anything like that that we kind of aspire to be like, they attach those people into their advertising. Because if you cannot build enough trust in your marketing, you can borrow trust from other people's other people's personalities, other people's authority. And so the more you can do that in your advertising, especially if you struggle, you don't have a well-known brand, you're not that big, something like that, you can borrow trust by using other people that people do trust or do look up to, right? Cool. Here's a simple example of some language, right? You're invited to an exclusive VIP program, be the first to unveil brand names premium collection, Approved, you can now join blank before everyone else, right? All kinds of stuff. There's some ideas here. If you have the slides, which I encourage you to do, again, if you don't know where to get them, go to my Instagram, at ashen.shanks, link in bio, top button there says London Slides. Grab this stuff, but this is stuff that you can use of just going, okay, how can we start presenting this style of language in our advertising? All right, biggest thing inside of, uh, or the ingredients to conspicuous consumption, Scarcity, urgency, and social pressure. If someone is uh, more on the line of uh, ego thinking or conspicuous consumption buying behaviors, the more you can enact these feelings, typically the better they respond. All right, art number two. Autonomy bias. Autonomy bias. So this is the tendency for self-determination and independence in decision-making processes, often at the expense of considering the impact of those decisions on others around them or the wider system as a whole. As humans, we want to feel in control of our lives. Even if we're not, we want to feel like we're in control. And so the big key here is how can you as a marketer create the feelings of control? Cool. Humans have an innate desire to be in charge of themselves. So the more marketers can attract, or the more marketers can demonstrate that you have control over your decisions, the better it will do. An example of a company uh, called Smile Train. They're a nonprofit company uh, that essentially helps kids with cleft palates overseas. And so if you've ever worked in the 501c3 space, nonprofit space, your biggest thing is how do we get more donors, right? And how do we get more donors who will give generously without really much in return? That's a very difficult thing to do. And so a big thing here, a cool case study that uh, Smile Train did, they, they at the time got most all their donations through direct response mail, right? Direct mail, sending letters in the mail, asking for donations. And this is how they would make their money. So they made one campaign test, and all they did in the entire campaign, there's no other difference, all they did was on the envelope of the mail that they sent, they said, make one gift now, and we'll never ask for another donation again. 
It's the only difference. Inside, same letter. But that's the only difference they did to enact that feeling that you have control over this decision. I will not continue to berate your mailbox, spam you. You're not going to continue hearing from me. You have control over what happens here now. And if you make one donation right here, I will never ask for another thing, right? The results, those who received the once and done letter donated $22,728, while those who received the standard letter donated $13,234. Almost, a, it's a 46% increase, right? So that did really, really well. Here's the thing. Out of those who received the once and done letter, only 39% of those people indicated that they never wanted to be contacted again. Most of the people that got that letter were perfectly fine hearing from you in the future. It was the idea that you made them feel like they were in control over that decision that it increased it. Overall, they had a 46% increase in donations. After that split test, they rolled it out to the rest of the list, and they generated over $260,000 just by a small sentence in their marketing. Everything else was the same. Just because you're giving your market the feeling that they have control, right? So here's another one. Everyone, anyone ever heard of Just Do It? Small company, you guys heard of it out of Oregon? Cool. So the campaign, the slogan was created by Dan Whiteman in 1988. He was a co-founder of the agency firm Whiten and Kennedy. And uh, they're, they were a larger agency. Now they're, they're very large. But the result, during the 1988, the company established a new record for revenue levels of income. And the consolidated revenues exceeded $1.2 billion, a 37% increase over 1987 and a 13% uh, over the company's previous year. $1.7 billion in 1989, immediately following the launch of this new slogan. The reason for this uh, is the concept, like if you guys know about uh, uh, fitness brands, right? You have like Under Armour, you have uh, um, Adidas, you have New Balance, you have all these companies, right? And all of them were really around the idea of either protection or athleticism at the time. And just do it, what they wanted to do was kind of create a concept where someone had the autonomy of what they do. They have full control of doing it or not doing it. And the interesting aspect of it is that one slogan like this that can en enact the feeling of us taking control and power over our decisions, increase them over 13% over the year, year over year and 37% over the following year. But this isn't just at like our levels. Like when we see these levels and we go, okay, 37% increase is not bad. How many of you increased over 100% in your last year? Oh, I kind of figured there'd be more. Yikes. <laughs> Either way. Don't worry, guys. You can hire me at the end of this presentation. But at the billion dollar level, 37% is unheard of. That makes no sense. Even 10% is pretty crazy. But at the billion dollar level, 37% makes zero sense. And the only really reason is they've drawn a line in the sand and they're going after people who are empowered or impassioned by taking control over their own lives with the saying, just do it. Pretty insane. Cool. Here's the big thing when it comes to autonomy bias. Uh, avoiding Hobson's choice is another psychological principle, which is essentially the idea of when you give someone only one option, to take it or not to take it, you are creating essentially an ultimatum for them, right? So in their head, what they're thinking is, do I want this or do I not want this, right? And you want to avoid that level of decision making. What you want to create is multiple options. You've probably heard of this before, but the reason you create or you see softwares give you like three, four options for what you can buy right, the different styles of membership. The reason for that is they are avoiding hops and choice of do I want this or not want this. When I can give you three or four options, your question or your brain now goes to which one of these do I want? Which one of these best solves my problem, right? And so in your marketing and advertising, the more you can try to avoid the hops and choice, the better. Because you want their brains to start thinking about which one of these options is better for me or can best solve my problem, not a do I want this product or do I not want this product, which is a much easier thing. This is often why people will start going, I need time to think, because they're needing the time to think of whether they want it or not want it, right? But if you can present different ways to get what they want, different paths, the question in their brain starts going to, hmm, yeah, I guess I don't know which one of these I want. And it's not a question of like, I just want to avoid this conversation and leave you. 
because I don't know if I want to do business with you, right? All right, examples, right? Because people are always like, ah, that's not true. But here's examples. People pay more to choose a seat on a plane. People pay more to change hotel reservations. They pay more for smaller snack items. You pay more for 100 calorie packs just because you can't control yourself, right? We pay more to stream music with no ads. We pay more for a beach chair that has three positions instead of one. We pay more for a fixed uh, rate mortgage with a float down option that allows them to change the interest rate after it's been locked in. We pay more for all of these things in our life just because we want the feeling of control, right? The 100 calorie pack. Is there really any difference? You can just grab two 100 calorie packs. There's no difference, but we feel like we have control and we're willing to pay for that amount, right? So it's everywhere and the more you can start looking at our advertising and going, do I, do I make my reader, do I make my prospects feel like they're in control here? The better. Cool. Uh, so ways you can invoke these feelings of autonomy. One, provide multiple options, avoid the Hobson's choice. Some of you, that won't be an option. You can't just have multiple options of service. You sell one thing and that's okay. But the other ways you can do this, I love this one. A, a, a telecommunications company once did this because they had a very, very large monopoly taking over and they were winning really, really well. In a situation that you uh, cannot make your reader feel like there's control, create a world for them where someone else is going to take their control. So what this telecommunications company, as an example, uh, the, that big company was lowering prices, right? Lowering prices, uh, and they were just consuming all of these other telecommunication company customers. And so what this company did, they sent out a, uh, a letter to their customers that said, um, I'm trying to remember it more exactly, it's like, uh, the, there's an extremely important decision you have to make today, but if you don't act now, someone else will make it for you. That was their headline. They got a 76% response rate on that sales letter from their customers. All because they created a world in their prospect's mind of if you don't take action, if you don't make a decision, someone else will make it for you and then you lose control. Even sometimes when it's a more expensive solution that you provide, you can keep people because they feel like they have more control working with you rather than someone else, right? And so if you struggle to find the place of where you can create autonomy, well, what else out there is removing their ability to have control? When it comes to Facebook ads, very simple, right? We did this with us. This is, if you guys have seen our advertising, we created this thing called decentralized account structures. The whole concept, right, was that Zuckerberg and data privacy people are removing your ability to scale your business with success. And unless you install this system, they will continue to take away your ability to grow your company. They're going to take it away, right? So many people want to talk about like, how do you scale Facebook ads post iOS 14? Or these hacks work so well. How about the feeling of you have no control over your life and business because someone else is removing your ability to make decisions? And a lot of times that's a way more powerful motivator than me just going scale your ROAS to 6x. Right? So if I can create a world where they're remove, getting their control removed, that's a lot of times a much big motivator. All right, finally... Remind the reader, this is the most basic one ever, right? But remind the reader of their freedom. Simply just reminding people in the BYAF technique, right? But you are free too, right? You've probably seen that in emails or copy, right? But you're free to leave. But you are free to not take action. But you are free to do all this, right? Even sometimes just reminding them even subtly of their control and their ability to make a decision or not make a decision will improve your marketing. Even just with that one line. Because it just reminds them and pulls them out of their pocket of thinking of going, oh, yeah, like, I could just, like, X out of this website and, like, not do anything. So even reminding them of that subtle level of control can actually improve conversions. All right, number three. How is this so far? Good? It's not too fast? Cool. Cool, cool, cool. How am I doing on time? Yikes. All right. Lost version bias. You guys are ready for speed? Because I, I was a debater all through school. Like, I can go fast. You know what I mean? All right. Lost aversion bias. Okay. Come on, guys. You guys got to know what you want. All right. 
Loss aversion bias. Simply speaking, the pain of losing $100 is greater than the pleasure you get from gaining $100. We hate losing things. We are collectors. We are hoarders as people. We do not like the idea of losing things, right? So, uh, essentially the idea is that most marketers are trained to think of benefits, right? What's in it for me, for your market? Um, but the new pockets of profit can really be found when you start to understand, like, what are the desires or the unrealized desires or pleasures that they could have by taking action with you, right? So, example, Uber Eats. If I was Uber Eats, I would entirely, like, especially during, like, COVID times or anytime gas prices are high, right? Like, I'm probably just not talking about the convenience of, of getting food delivered to me, but I actually might create a commercial where the, the older guy is like sitting in the chair, he's watching the game, right? There's two minutes on the clock. And all of a sudden, his like wife comes in and like turns off the TV and is like, you said you would get food an hour ago. Where are you? And you're creating that concept of like you're missing out on the things you don't even realize it. You're missing out on the last two minutes of a game because you're not doing action with us, right? I'm trying to create those things in their mind of like what are the, the, the desires or the pleasures they could have that they don't even realize right now because it's not a pain. But if they take action they'll receive those desires, receive those benefits, right? And so I'm trying to create those concepts for them, especially for a lot of you, if your business is designed more around luxury or things that are not needed, but it's nice to have, this is what you have to focus on. You have to focus on the pains that are unrealized or the benefits that are unrealized because they're not taking action, right? No one here right now is thinking about, man, my neighbors are super jealous of me because I don't have, like, when I have a Ferrari. You're not thinking about that. But if I can create a marketing campaign idea that illustrates how jealous everyone in your world will be, that you are the top dog, that you are the person they want to be like because you have a Ferrari, all of a sudden that desire becomes a little bit more tangible, a little bit more persuasive because you're thinking of a new future that you don't even know you have yet, right? Example, do you make these mistakes in English? Um, this was one of the oldest running ads. It ran for over 40 years, uh, and it didn't stop running in, until the company just eventually sold. But this ad never went down, and it did really well. All it sold was a little handbook on speaking better English. It was, a, it was an English-speaking course in a book, right? Super sexy. But what they had to do was a loss aversion bias of trying to illuminate you on maybe you're making mistakes that you're even unaware of. Do you make these mistakes in English? And then that's, that's the whole angle of how they were doing it. This one, right? Insane facts about Bitcoin. Number 12, $100 in Bitcoin, if you invested it in 2010, would be worth $2 billion. I'm creating a future that you don't know exists or a present that you don't know exists because I'm illuminating you on facts that you're not aware of. And then I'm creating a future. If you read that, now you're going, maybe I should put $100 into Bitcoin, right? Another one, search for unclaimed money. There's more than $40 billion sitting in state governments. Is any of it yours? Loss aversion bias. We hate that feeling that we could be losing something or missing out on something. We hate that feeling. And so if you tell me that there's something that's mine, but I don't even know it's mine, I'm going to take action on it because I, I want what's mine, right? Whole idea. Even as simple as limited edition. The idea of limited edition. We hate the feeling that we could be missing out on something, and so we want to take advantage of it. All right. Ways to do loss aversion bias. Replace language, such as taking advantage or get in on with don't miss. Things that make us feel like we're going to miss on an opportunity, right? Frame messaging in terms of a loss rather than gain, right? So how many ad mistakes do you make? Will you pass your annual physical? Can you answer these five critical objections on your next sales call? We're creating the idea of there is something that you should have, but you don't have it. Do you want to take action to make sure you get it, right? Then the idea of switching out discount co codes to expiring credits. People don't like discount codes. That feels like it's something that they don't currently have and they could decide to take action on it or not. Expiring credits means it's something you have and you'll lose it if you don't take action, right? So we're just creating that concept in people's mind of loss version bias. Art number four, self-serving bias. Um, so the whole concept is if you, are, uh, if you are in school, right, you're taking a test and you failed the test, well, if you failed the test, the teacher hated you. If you aced the test, you worked really hard, right? Uh, if you have a client in your program and it didn't go well at all, what do they think? Well, if they did really well, it's because they're a really smart business owner and they studied really hard and they worked really hard and they have a good offer. If they failed, my coach sucked. The program was a scam, 
right? This is how people think. It's self-serving bias. We always want to paint ourselves in the best light. And so Blair Warren, a famous copywriter, says, what, uh, people will do anything for those who encourage their dreams, justify their failures, ally their fears, confirm their suspicions, and help throw rocks at their enemies. If you as a business in marketing can do just that and only that, you will be the top competitor in your space. If you can make people feel like they are justified in their failures, it's not their fault, or confirm their suspicions, or help them throw rocks at their enemies, you will win. Example, 20,679 physicians say Luckies are less irritating, it's toasted. What are they saying in that ad? They're saying it's not your fault your throat hurts, you're smoking the wrong brand. Right? <laughs> Five minutes, got it. Next one. How to get what the U.S. government owes you. What are they saying? It's not your fault you're poor. The government is stealing from you. Right? Time Magazine. The weight loss trap. Right? Uh, low carbs, low fat, basically selling a new diet. Why your diet isn't winning. What they're saying is, it's not your fault you're fat. You're following the wrong diet. This is advertising. The more you can do this, the more you can make someone feel like it's not their fault that they don't have what they want in life. It's because someone, something, or somehow was hiding it from them, and you can give them the path there. That's how you win, right? That's all this is. It's self-serving bias. The more I can make you feel like a winner and that your losses or your faults are not your own, then I win. You're going to trust me over someone else, even if someone else has better advice. Again, not talking about ethics, talking about marketing persuasion. Cool. Way to do this. Ways to invoke it. Positive and neutral reinforcement, right? Highlight legacy and history as a means to amplify perceived value. If you've seen companies that say, founded in 1926, what does that mean? Like, that doesn't mean anything. Like, you could be a terrible company and be around since 1926. Like, that means nothing. But people use it because we believe that legacy attaches itself to trust, right? Framing and anchoring in the behaviors that you see you want your prospect to do, right? Talking about, hey, you're a risk taker, you're an adventurer, someone who isn't afraid to take action in your copy, you're pre-framing them to think like that, right? Just like if, you, if I say, hey, you're, you're an adventurous person, right? You like to go on adventures? Almost everyone is going to say yes, even if they're not. But I've started to pre-frame it, and I'm using it like a positive enforcement, right? I said, right? Because I want you to agree with me. And if you can do that in your advertising, you start to get people to think like you or the way you want them to think. Emphasize to prospects that uh, taking action uh, is directly influencing their own success, right? By you clicking this button, you are taking the first step on your road to six figures a month, right? Like, I'm shrinking down the time collapse to go, don't even worry about all the action that takes later. Make this one micro decision now, and you're already that identity, right? The more I can do that, the more you start to think like me, and the more you trust me, and the more actions you'll take. R number five, and we're running through it. I think I've got like two minutes at this point. Present bias and hyperbolic discounting. All right, so present bias is the tendency to overvalue near-term rewards uh, and present over incremental progress, right? This is why people will invest into Bitcoin and not into the stock market because the stock market is 8% year over year for the next 10 years in Bitcoin. I want to get rich tomorrow, right? This is present bias. Hyperbolic discounting is that people will value instant gratification over delayed gratification. This is why AT&T will give you a phone for free. All you have to do is sign a four-year contract, right? Or you get the first year at 20 bucks a month, but what happens in year three? Like it quadruples in price. Why? Because as humans, we want instant gratification. And we're willing to sign things or commit to things that are not good for us in the long run, but because it's better for us now, we'll go ahead and do it, right? So this is how humans think. So last couple things here. Uh, Basically, the whole idea, Sigmund Freed, famous psychologist, people, by and large, make decisions on pleasure. We're pleasure-oriented people. Final ones, uh, J.G. Wentworth, it's my money, I need it now. Ever heard of it? Yeah. Awesome, we got some millennials here. So, uh, basically, that whole concept, actually, Ben, in the back, what's the difference between structured settlements and normal settlements inside of a lawsuit? Is that some old guy in the room or the lawyer? You're the lawyer, bro. Yikes. Okay. Structure settlements. More cash up front, less whole amount, but it's paid to you over time, right? So you're in a car accident. Instead of waiting two years for that lawsuit to finish, hey, you can probably get a lot more cash quickly, but it's going to be a smaller cash amount, and you're going to be paid monthly, right? So that's a structure settlement. 
J.G. Wentworth, that's all that they do, right? As soon as they launched that campaign, it's my money and I need it now, they had a 50% increase in calls and leads from that one campaign because they're emphasizing on the concept, even though structural settlements is worse than a standard settlement, people want stuff now. And so that was their campaign strategy idea, right? 10 million plus in revenue from that single ad. Next one, Snickers, 2007 to 2009, they had a sales growth decline. They were losing market share. In 2009, they released the campaign. If you guys remember, you're not you when you're hungry. I've seen these ads, yeah. What happens in that ad? They're crabby, they're upset, right? They're frustrated. They take one bite of the Snickers bar, back to normal, instant. Instant gratification. As soon as they launched this campaign, their sales worldwide increased 15.9% and they gained market share in 56 of their 58 markets from this one campaign. And whether you knew it or not, all they were telling you was that you were gonna get instant gratification when you ate the Snickers bar. That's it. We think it's funny and that's why we buy, but that's not why we buy. Because when we're hangry or when we're upset or we want something sweet, we think Snickers because in the commercials they showed us if we take it, we immediately get our gratification. Right? 100%. <laughs> All right. Running through easy ways to invoke this feeling is immediate benefits. So one, uh, free two-day shipping or how can you increase the onboarding time? How can you speed up the transition from the time they, of what they want to the time they actually get it? Next way, buy now, pay layer options. I'm not a huge fan of this in the coaching space. I actually think that it goes against a lot of psychology, but if you have businesses outside of coaching, this is what I, you could recommend is buy now, pay later, things like that. Other benefits, right? How can you get your clients to sign longer term contracts uh, by giving them more upfront, right? People will do this. If you can give them more services, more features, whatever, they will sign longer term contracts. Um, if it's cheaper, better flexibility on pricing or bonuses, people will do this. In the agency world, I know someone here was an agency side, right? But it's like, okay, four months, we're 8K a month. Four months easy. But if you sign a six month contract, it's 8K a month and I'll work in email services for free. Easy, right? Or if you do this, I'll give you why. Right? All of these kind of things, I've increased my revenue by that retainer of 33% if I can get them to sign that contract. If I can give them a service that costs me $1,000 a month to fulfill, who's winning? Me. But they will feel like they're winning. And that's good because everyone wins in that situation. Right? So those are easy ways for you to think. That's it, guys.